another Ohio native. A part of NASA even before there was a NASA. Many people may not remember this, but Neil Armstrong was here from the very beginning. An experienced naval aviator and the youngest pilot in his squadron, he flew some 78 combat missions during the Korean War and returned home a decorated veteran. Armstrong later joined the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, which was NASA's predecessor, as you learned. And there he was a test pilot at the Lewis Laboratory in Cleveland. He later transferred to Edwards Air Force Base, where he was a project pilot on many high-speed aircraft. Among them, the X-15. He made seven flights in the X-15, reaching 4,000 miles per hour at an altitude of more than 207,000 feet. In 1962, Neil Armstrong was selected in the second class of astronauts, and in 1966, he and Dave Scott made history during their Gemini 8 flight by achieving the first docking in space. His calm and methodical approach to flying saved the mission after the spacecraft began spinning dangerously out of control. In 1969, Armstrong was selected as commander for Apollo 11. And on July 20th, with only about 20 seconds of fuel remaining, he safely set that lunar module Eagle on the surface of the moon, meeting the challenge President John F. Kennedy gave the nation with five months to spare. Ladies and gentlemen, again, it is a high honor and pleasure to introduce to you Neil Armstrong. Thank you, Leon, and thank all of you. In the summer of 1958, the Congress wrote and the President signed the National Space Act, establishing the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And I remember the time clearly. Uh, Fifty years ago this week, I was high above the California desert, piloting a B-29 carrier aircraft and launching the X-1E the latest and most advanced of the fabled X-1 research airplane series. NASA became an operating agency on October 1st, 1958. I found myself that Wednesday morning uh, going to work at my same job, my same office, doing the same work that I'd been doing the previous day. It was a relatively easy transition. We were already riding on rockets in research aircraft. We already knew how to count backwards. Eight, seven, six, five. We, we had merely to paint over the C in NACA and <clears throat> replace it with an S on our airplanes, our trucks, and vans. As the other principal components of the new agency, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, the California Institute of Technology, and the Army's Redstone Arsenal in Re Huntsville, Alabama, assumed they were deciding what the minimum amount of painting would be required at their installations and what new responsibilities they would face. In any case, I suspect there are some number of people here tonight who remember the birth of NASA and were a part of those early days. So I, I would like to ask those here tonight who were founding members of NASA, those from NACA, those from JPL, those from Redstone, and those who came from various other places to join NASA in the year 1958. I'd like those of you who are seated in that category to stand and those of you who are standing to raise your hands and let me hear from you. Congratulations. You'll be recognized as old fogies. The old fogies that we are and of which we are exceedingly proud. 
And here tonight, uh, a half century later, we look back on, on what has been accomplished. Our knowledge of the universe around us is, has increased a thousandfold and more. We learned that Homo, Homo sapiens was not forever imprisoned by the gravitational field of Earth. Performance, efficiency, reliability, and safety of aircraft have improved remarkably. We've sent probes throughout the solar system and beyond. We've se seen deeply into our universe and look backward nearly to the beginning of time. We were a competitor in perhaps the greatest peacetime competition of all time, the space race, USA versus USSR. Like a war, it was expensive. Like a war, each side wanted intelligence on what the other side was doing. And I'll not assert that the space race was a diversion which prevented a war. Nevertheless, it was a diversion. It was intense. It, it did allow both sides to take the high road with the objectives of science and learning and exploration. Eventually, it provided a mechanism for engendering cooperation between adversaries. In that sense, among, other, among others, it was an exceptional national investment for each side. I submit that one of the most important roles of government is to inspire and motivate its citizens, and particularly its young citizens, to love to learn, to strive to participate in and contribute to societal progress. And by that measure, NASA will, without doubt, rank in the top tier of government enterprises. That goal is far more than just going faster and higher and further. Our goal, indeed, our responsibility, is to develop new options for future generations. Options in expanding human knowledge, exploration, human settlements, and resource development outside in the universe around us. Our highest and most important hope is that the human race will improve its intelligence, its character, and its wisdom so that we'll be able to properly evaluate and choose among those options and the many others they will encounter in the years ahead. And I look forward to watching the progress and the, those exciting developments and hearing a status report when we gather again for NASA's 100th anniversary. <laughs>